Hello everyone and welcome back to AMOS, our course on Agile methods and open source software. We are now going to discuss quality assurance in Scrum and Extreme Programming as taught in the AMOS projects. This follows uh, our previous discussions of technical product management as carried out by the Scrum product owner as well as software development practices as carried out by the Scrum software developer. As it turns out, quality assurance, unlike in traditional settings in Scrum, is also the job of the software developer. So in this session, we will look at uh, code review practices and development processes as related to testing and quality assurance. So first, code review. Code review is uh, by definition the systematic examination of computer program code uh, with the purpose of improving the quality of the software. Quality improvements usually means finding bugs, but can also relate to the overall structure and quality architecture maintenance of guidelines or rules as they are applied to the source code. Um, such uh, review can be done in various forms, as we will see, or as we will look at here, specifically at pair programming and pre-commit code reviews. You can really do it all the time or in defined points of time. And depending on the point of time, different forms apply. So in the moment, you can that's basically what software developers are doing. In their mind, they are continuously switching between programming and reviewing the code they write. Um, the first important point in time is when you commit, when you decide to commit your code, you're giving it a certain seal of quality approval. So that's when perhaps a review is appropriate. At any other point in time during the project and of course before there is a release or a handover for example to a client in the past and traditional development that's where most of the code review uh, would happen because it was considered expensive. We will look at uh, pair code programming and pre-commit uh, code review in the following slides. So pair programming is uh, the practice of having two people, a pair of programmers work with each other as they are implementing code. Only one person, only one programmer is actually writing code. The other person is reviewing, observing and reviewing and commenting. So then uh, you have two very different activities, one in the thick of programming with perhaps sometimes a keyhole view of things as they are focused on getting syntax and details right and the other at a much higher level strategically looking at what code is being written is it creating problems is it the right code being written etc so the first person is the programmer and the second one is the reviewer the purpose of such pair programming is of course in the first step assuring the quality of the code that's being written. In general less code may be written than if you had these two people work independently but having them work together the quality of the code uh, is likely to be much higher and create less bugs and hence be much more hassle-free longer term than if these two people would be working independently each writing their own code. Uh, by now the uh, uh, empirical evidence suggests that a pair of programmers is more effective in total than two individual people. A purpose, another purpose of uh, pair programming is that in the collaboration around the code there's collaborative learning. So both parts of the pair are effectively uh, learning more and more effectively than if they were working alone. They're discussing things, they are in the collaboration where they're fixing things, learning things, etc. 
At the same time, they have to talk at times, not all the time, obviously no programming would get done if they were only talking, but they have to talk at times when, say, the reviewer interrupts the programmer to point out a problem. By then, or at that point of time, the latest, knowledge sharing takes place as these two people are sharing their understanding of the code base and knowledge flows from one to the other. Now, together with pairs not necessarily always being static, but rather people moving around over time, you ensure that the knowledge that one person has spreads throughout the whole team. So pair programming leads to some or better knowledge sharing. The programmer and the reviewer are sometimes also called the driver. That's the programmer and the co-driver. So that's the reviewer or the pilot. Again, that's the programmer or the navigator. That's the uh, reviewer. The way you should think and go about it is to make it comfortable. Yeah? So find some person you can work with. Um, as you have decided for a day to a pair program, uh, you should not be sticking to one role. You should actually be switching roles. I'm not sure you have to switch them often, but you sh certainly shouldn't be programming all the time and the other person should always be reviewing all the time. Rather, you should uh, switch and you should not forget to communicate. It's not that you have to pair program everything. You Small stuff you can do on your own and certainly you will need to take your breaks. In general, the assumption in agile programming and extreme programming is that in terms of effective programming hours in a day, maybe you can get four or five hours out of a eight day work day, eight hour work day uh, in, and that would be a lot already. Make sure that you switch partners. So not necessarily during a day, but across days in order to foster better collaborative learning and of course, knowledge sharing. Here is Dilbert on pair programming. Uh, interestingly enough, pair programming was the one thing upsetting people most. As you can see here, Nobody would like to work uh, with Wally. <laughs> they all jumped to Ashok uh, to be pair programming uh, with him. Obviously, this cartoon is wrong. Uh, it's not 40 hours a week all on one computer. As just mentioned, it's uh, usually at max half of the workday that you might be pair programming and also not necessarily all the days. And certainly you should switch people. Here's another <laughs> attempt or attack of uh, uh, pair programming um, where, well, you can see the Im immediate hesitation that uh, people might have as to how much will I enjoy working with a particularly obnoxious person here, uh, here, Wally. And indeed, I think pair programming is not for everyone, but if you can do it, it's very effective. It can be very effective and can help knowledge sharing. So it's actually good to put in the effort and try to be a pair programmer. Again, you don't have to do it all the time. Another form or another point of time in terms of code review is the pre-commit code review. Pair programming was low-key, uh, low stakes, commenting on somebody else's code as they were writing it. And uh, their response would be to discuss it in place and react appropriately. Now, pre-commit code review is code review that you perform before someone uh, commits their code. Or more precisely, somebody else in pre-commit code review submits their code for review so that someone else, a second person, the reviewer, uh, gets to lay their eyes on it, comment on it, maybe even suggests improvements before possibly letting it through or giving the original author the permission to commit it. 
The idea here is also, again, code review, somebody is commenting on it, to the extent that you can make it a requirement that somebody else signs off on it. And indeed, tools, um, uh, tools can enforce this second person sign off. So tools like Garrett or on, uh, are effectively on GitHub by way of pull requests, uh, you can enforce a pre-commit code review. So it's not all the time it is when someone thinks the code is ready, but that also means that for this code review to be effective, uh, it has to be sufficiently small. Nobody wants to nobody wants to review huge amounts of code and sign off on it when they don't really understand that code. So a simple best practice of pre-commit code review is to keep your commits small and get the sign off. This very much comes from open source where we know that the small commits get accepted into open source projects and the big ones are more, much more likely to get rejected. So you know already code review, students already know code review, pre-commit code review by way of GitHub's pull requests. Um, here's a, here are three screenshots from Garrett, a tool which uh, handles pre-commit code review separately from, uh, from uh, GitHub. So you can see here how someone uh, submitted a set of patches uh, to a project and now the second person, the reviewer who is supposed to sign off on it, on the, on the code, on the submission, on the commit, uh, can walk through these changes, look at all the individual changes and comment on them, leading possibly to a back and forth between the reviewer and the original programmer. So um, the reviewer would ask questions and only if, um, if the questions are successfully addressed should the reviewer accept the uh, code submission and give it its stamp of approval. How then the commit, commit makes it into the code base depends. So maybe the reviewer has the authority to let it through. Maybe the reviewer uh, sets the flag that the original author can commit it. Or maybe the original author just uh, does it because it was purely a convention that they waited for the LGTM, the looks good for me, sign of looks good to me, sign of approval by the reviewer. Pre-commit code review, like pair programming, improves knowledge sharing and uh, teamwork because you are aware now that other people will look at your work. Uh, so you will make sure that uh, your code is readable and understandable. Um, the others get to see your code, so they are implicitly and very directly learning about your code and you're communicating about it. There may well be a back and forth as to what your code does between the programmer and the reviewer, thereby spreading knowledge around. Unlike with pair programming, where the pairs are set, at least usually for the day, um, if you organize it appropriately in pre-commit code review, the reviewers might change all the time. And so you might get knowledge sharing spread out even faster than in pair programming. Because developers know that the code gets reviewed like that, they just get much more disciplined, they write the code more nicely, they know it's there to be written, they, uh, to be read, they know it needs to be understood, they know it needs to be as comparatively small commit so that the person who signs off on it, and if you will, is on the hook then for your code, is actually willing to do that rather than to push back to you and reject your code, which usually, obviously, you don't want. So that raises the overall quality of uh, the code being written. At the same point of time, you also spread a feeling of responsibility around. 
uh, it's actually not that res feeling of responsibility gets weakened because now someone else signed off on it. No, you as the original programmer still feel responsible, but now also the reviewers feel some, so some form of responsibility for your code, uh, for the code that others have written, and it thereby fosters a feeling or understanding of collective uh, code ownership. So there's some overlap between Agile methods and open source software development in terms of uh, code review, even though they come from, uh, from different angles. So both realize that code is read much more, much more often than it is uh, written. And both reflect this in their practices. Agile methods, however, say there's collective code ownership uh, while open source in general has individual or small team-based code ownership. So the collective code ownership in Agile methods tends to be, tends to allow for feature-oriented development. You can drive a feature from the UI, UI all the way into the database, touching on everything along the way. Uh, while in open source software development with a component-oriented architecture, people are often responsible for their component and that's it. So if you have a feature that touches multiple components, all those people in those components may have to coordinate, which of course creates more work, creates more friction, etc. Um, but ultimately both sides are coming together here. First of all, Agile Methods realizes not everyone's a full stack developer. so said feature-oriented development often leads to feature teams where there are multiple people with different specializations on different tiers or layers in the architecture collaborate and say one's responsible for the UI, a second person is responsible for the domain model and a third is uh, responsible for the uh, persistence layer. While at in uh, in uh, uh, open source software development also people understand that some functionality needs to be implemented across components and since it's open source one person may actually be able to pull it off the challenge then is though that they have to submit their changes in disjoint sets of commits to the respective components coordinating that is actually hard and getting those patches accepted means they need to be accepted independently for each component that is touched independently of the other. So they need to do a lot of explaining why these patches are needed, how they play together with another patch set sent to another component. Agile methods, the original Agile methods in, as an extreme programming, uh, loves pair programming. Everyone's a peer changes are reviewed in the moment. And you really can't do that in open source because, well, there is no in the moment synchronous collaboration, usually in open source. People live in different time zones are distributed around. Today with online collaboration, you might meet in on the internet, but still people tend not to do it. Rather, they review patches, so perform pre-commit code review. So you can argue that um, pre-commit code review really came from open source, made it into general programming as well as agile methods in particular. So after uh, looking at quality assurance as afforded by, um, by code review for different forms of code review, Let's now look at the different development and build setups again uh, that people have created. And specifically, this is leading up to continuous delivery and DevOps. So by development cycle, I mean the basic way of working, the steps the developer takes to get the code to work and to do uh, to carry out the actual action, run the program, 
as intended. So here's how it looks like for a beginner. A beginner edits some files, compiles them and builds them, also creates a binary from it. And well, if it usually tests by hand, uh, so if you're a novice beginner, you test by hand. And then if it seems to work, you deploy the software maybe on some website. Uh, so that's what a student in AUD or any beginner's course, Algorithms and Data Structures or Programming 101 would do. Pretty quickly, as you may build some practical experience, uh, this will change and you will make a distinction between um, just programming something and maintaining this in a code repository and deploying into production from a code repository. So somewhat more experienced, a practitioner will also go through this added compile build uh, cycles until the software seems right. Deploy to a test environment, which usually just means running it locally on their own workstation. But once they are satisfied, they will commit the work to a code repository, a version control system, so that there is some defined tracking of the code base where they can even go back to older versions of the software. From the version control system, a specific version deemed the authoritative for the release version, what have you, a practitioner will build and deploy and then put into production the software they are developing. That's also still a pretty simplistic uh, view of things. A real professional will have a test system in between uh, their own development environment and the production system. So a professional developer will have the added compile build, deploy and test on the workstation and then commit to a code rep uh, code to, uh, uh, to version control. Um, the test system is something that runs uh, uh, and uh, will fetch or uh, will get deployed the uh, new version of the software as committed to the version control where the tests run. And if the tests are successful, usually still by hand, uh, and this is the, so the desire, then there will be a release, meaning there's a particular uh, version number set to the software, uh, which also signifies a quality seal of approval, and that will then get submitted, deployed to production. That's how for the longest time software development prior to automation uh, looked like and all of these steps, the commit and the testing and the release and the deployment to production were manual steps carried out by software developers and quality assurance engineers and release managers uh, leading to the deployed production system, which then would be monitored and operated in place. Now, agile methods and increasing automation has given us improvements here, which were most, most notably the uh, automation of the testing routines by way of test frameworks. So not manual testing any longer, but really automated testing, which precede the commit uh, to the version control. So you can now run the tests automatically and reject any commit if tests are failing. And you can also apply that to the release of the code base um, um, before you accept the release. Also ensure that not only are the tests run, but are set uh, delivering a green successful completion of tests result. And I would like to look at that in more detail now. These were the increasing with increasing complexity development cycles that professionals go through. With that, continuous integration as one of the more recent developments in improving 
automation and quality of software development. So in the olden days, huh? so in the uh, people used to test by hand. We would have large numbers of quality assurance engineers who would follow scripts, scripts manually test the software and what have you. This is has been increasingly automated over time um, with computational power becoming cheap with new frameworks coming becoming available JUnit is about 23 24 years old was preceded by SUnit for small talks so that's maybe 25 26 years old highly successful framework that popularized unit testing and automated testing thereby for all kinds of software being developed. So test automation is the automate, automated execution of these tests and giving feedback to developers and managers on the quality of the software in the form of failing or succeeding uh, tests. Continuous integration based on test automation is a process by which any commit to a code repository automatically triggers uh, the full cycle of building the software, including the new commit, testing the software based on uh, also running the tests for the software to derive a status on the quality of the most recent version of the software in the code repository under version control. And obviously, if the tests are failing, something is wrong. So you would get, say, on a dashboard, the information that the uh, builds are failing, that either the builds are failing, but that's even before testing, or that the tests are failing. And in many development shops, that is a very visible display of the status of, of the code base. You can arrange this in different ways. For example, you can have a pre-commit trigger where the build and test runs before the commit is officially accepted into the code repository. Then you usually do that if you want to reject the commit in case it breaks the build or makes the tests fail. The alternative is to accept the commit and then have all things go flashing red if build if the build fails and the test the build breaks and the tests, all the tests fail. So you can also simply accept the commit, assume everything's fine, but then uh, if discipline was not maintained and it was in fact a faulty commit, uh, only flag it then. You can then still decide to roll back the commit because you don't want the broken code base to get in the way of other software developers' uh, work. For all of this to work, you need to have those tests. And for that, you need to have some sort of test-driven development as previously discussed in an earlier slide deck. The status used to be kind of as a humorous historic note, lava lamps. Um, 20 years ago, computational power still seemed not so cheap as today. So people would hook up lava lamps to the USB ports or serial ports back then of some of the build server and signal by way of green or red lava lamps whether the build was fine. Today, of course, you have much more elaborate dashboards which show you the status of the build. Given that today we have um, many component microservice-based architectures, you will have per work stream, per microservice, per major architectural component, your own uh, information dashboard to tell you how it's doing. So here is some older screenshots using Jenkins, one of the continuous integration tools. And you can see how it shows the different modules that they build and that they also are tested individually. Okay, so here they still show the changes uh, of one commit and then they show the tests that were run on these modules and components 
total number and whether they failed, hooray, none failed here. But also maybe not a lot of tests in some cases. So the sole test automation turned continuous integration is managed by proper tools these days, which also give immediate feedback as to things being okay, everything's green, or something's fading, everything's flashing, all the way to engineering managers being called in to pop up behind the developer who was identified as providing the faulty commit. So finally, after we have continuous integration, which lets us, which enables us to always have a working code base, which builds and where all the tests succeed, Agile methods took it one step further to continuous deployment. So beyond building and testing all the time, beyond every single commit leading to a build and test run, which kept the dashboard or all the signals on green, continuous deployment now takes that just built and passed all tests code from the product, the project under development, and deploys it to production automatically. That is quite a frightening step uh, for many it was and for many still is today because if it's fully automated, no human is looking at it any longer and things so easily go wrong. So now you really want to make sure that your code base is thoroughly tested by way of automated tests, has high test coverage, and only then can you take out the human from the equation, meaning not requiring a human any longer who will push that deploy to production button for the software. The benefits you gain is that the time from a developer programs something, they're paid for it, so there's some cost here. Uh, the time from something is programmed to it creates the economic value that it's supposed to create because it's put into production, you can make that really short now. If there's no human in the loop from the commit of the developer to the software being put into production, we are now talking about, well, maybe minutes or sometimes um, when that developer's work creates its economics benefit. So innovation gets sped up really quickly and there's very little delay between the cost and the supposed benefit. It creates the potential revenues in terms of, say, a web application that it's supposed to increase takes place. So this um, continuous deployment is the high end of uh, automating everything after the creative, uh, creative work of a developer was done and signaled by way of a commit. Um, it's also technically challenging, so many things can go wrong. Within the company, you now need a nicely working build and testing pipeline. You need substantial amounts of tests to feel good, to automatic, to allow for automated putting into production. And of course, you need to educate developers to write those tests in such a way that things are covered that otherwise usually only humans would capture as a problem. Um, there are many issues that, uh, that cause problems but that not, are not bugs or that are easily caught in testing. Assume someone coincidentally changes the color of text and it's now white text on white background. Imagine that white text is the buy button on white, white background in some web shop. Well, no user, no customer will find it any longer and no money is being made. So some of the problems that a human tester easily finds are not so easy to detect by a computer because there's 
not, still not, ever will be, perhaps as intelligent as humans. So as a consequence, um, not only do you need to test more smartly, you still need a human to look at and you need also measures in place that deal with these unforeseen situations. So for that reason, uh, in the continuous deployment process, um, you have yet another escalation to continuous delivery where you have safeguards in place that, for example, will roll back, will roll back a deployment to production because not because tests fail, then you would never have deployed, but because a watchdog or a monitoring system tells you that something's wrong and that uh, hence you should roll back and have a human look at it. So you proactively deploy to production, but then you have a monitoring system that, for example, in, in the web shop example, will uh, watch for our customers buying is total... Uh, total revenue is going down or up and if total revenue is going down because customers aren't buying any, any longer even if you don't know why you will still roll back to the previous version so you define a set of key metrics that are independent of the tests you define that set of key metrics and you measure those and those will give you the indication of whether you should perhaps roll back to a previous version of the software which is really the high end because that's not easily done. Imagine there was a database backup um, when you deploy to production and now you have to roll back uh, that database backup. Well, that may be really nasty. As a consequence, there are all kinds of techniques in between where that rollout to production is only temporary or uses can canaries, meaning it's only tried in a few instances before there is an expansion of the uh, of the rollout to all of uh, all of production and so forth so there are various measures that you can apply to to mitigate some of these issues still this is as of me speaking uh, the high end of software development uh, not everyone can do it uh, easily so under continuous delivery, you have these escalating stages of capabilities you need to have. First of all, you need to get all your tests automated, testing automated. Um, then you need to have build and testing pipelines where you continuously take commits by developers, build them, integrate them and run the tests. And the final step is the automated deployment of the output of the continuous integration build and testing processes, the continuous deployment of that to production. So these things can be built incrementally. So you can start with tests and testing. You can expand it to continuous integration and most companies will want to do that. Writing tests, more tests is generally good. Uh, continuously integrating them to have at any point of time uh, and time adequate status information on the quality of your code base. That is also undisputably good and everyone wants that. Many companies still shy away from continuous deployment, meaning putting that those code changes into production is something not everyone wants to do. Sometimes simply because they don't trust their own capabilities but sometimes they will all argue it's also a matter of uh, the operating, uh, the production environment. Assume, for example, uh, you have software updates to a car. Do you want to deploy every few minutes because there's some new feature that some developer developed for the center console infotainment? Probably your users will not want that to change all the time, nor will the OEMs, the car companies and so forth. Nevertheless, it's conceivable. And maybe as cars turn into uh, just data centers rolling around, it's actually closer in our future than we might think. There's one final step to be taken called DevOps development operations, where 
what I described as continuous deployment, continuous delivery, really requires for it to work a change in culture of people. So in the past, developers would work Monday to Friday, nine to five, and would go home. It was the poor quality assurance engineers who had to wear pagers uh, to be informed if something goes wrong on the weekend and come in then. And then they would pull in developers on the weekend too. With DevOps, uh, on the one hand, everyone's on call all the time. And on the other hand, you autumn try to automate away the failure cases by way of rollbacks so that you don't have to come in on the weekend if something breaks. With that, in this session, we looked at code review practices for improving the quality of commits, code and commit, or commits to the version control system, compared agile methods versus open source, which is always a hard comparison because agile is feature oriented and open source is component oriented. And then we looked at uh, different escalating stages of automation in the build and testing processes from simple test automation all the way to uh, continuous deployment of and DevOps of the software being developed to production, which is the high end of where companies usually want to go these days. That's it for me. Thank you very much for your time and attention and see you in the next session.